Good evening and welcome from the Nashua River Watershed Association. I'm Martha Morgan, the Water Programs Director at the NRWA. For those of you not familiar with the NRWA, we are a member-supported organization based in Groton. The three main focus areas for NRWA's work are land protection, education, and water resource protection in the 32 communities in Massachusetts and New Hampshire that make up our watershed, from the Wachusett Reservoir in the south into which the Quinnipoxit River flows, north to the Nashua's confluence with the Merrimack River in Nashua, New Hampshire. If you're not currently an NRWA member, I invite you to become one. This is the first in a series of talks about rivers and fisheries river restoration, trout refugia in the face of climate change, the return of river herring, the importance of good water quality and mussel habitat and more. If you received an email announcing this talk, you will receive another regarding future presentations, or you can go to our website for more information, nashuariverwatershed.org. Before starting, I want to acknowledge the Massachusetts Environmental Trust, whose grant to the NRWA is sponsoring this series of talks and is also funding NRWA's effort to place temperature loggers in streams to help with trout refugia mapping projects. Where the cold water fish seek refuge as temperatures rise two degrees, four degrees and six degrees uh, Celsius um, is, is the concern of this, these projects. And this is also the topic of the talk in May, on May 13th. MET receives its funding solely through the sale of environmental license plates, which you can get at whaleplate.org. Our family has two of the leaping brook trout plates. And I have to say to the anglers watching that when my daughter was in Montana for grad school and, it was, and was driving around with Massachusetts plates, she received instant credibility from anglers when they saw the mass plates with the leaping brook trout. Now to our program. In March 2014, the NRWA's executive board expressed their support to the Division of Ecological Restoration and the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority for the removal of the Oakdale Dam on the Quinnipoxit River. This project is a joint effort by the Division of Ecological Restoration, the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, and the Department of Conservation and Recreation. I'm delighted to welcome and to introduce our presenter and panelists for this evening's talk. Leading the talk will be Nick Wildman. Nick is a certified ecological restoration professional and the dam removal practice lead for the Massachusetts Division of Ecological Restoration. As part of this work, as part of this work, Nick is the division's lead on several high profile dam removal projects and directs the division's overall efforts to increase the frequency of and benefits from dam removal in the state. Nick has 15 years of private and public sector experience directing river and wetland projects in the Northeast. He holds a Master's of Environmental Management degree from Duke University. Joining Nick will be John Gregoire, the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority's Program Manager of Reservoir Operations for the Sudbury and Wachusett Reservoirs. Jamie Carr, a Regional Director of DCR's Water Supply Protection Division for the Wachusett Reservoir and Sudbury Reservoirs and Catherine Parent, the Education Coordinator with the DCR's Water Supply uh, Protection Division for the Wachusett and Sudbury Re Reservoirs. And now I will turn it over to Nick. Thank you for that introduction, Martha. Really appreciate it. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. I wish I could see you all. Um, I, I wish we could do this all in, in, in the same room together. And uh, let's all just hope that we can do that another time in the not too distant future to talk about this project or another. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to talking with you. As Martha said, I've got about a 30 to 40 minute presentation. So that should leave us more than enough time for Q&A at the end. So thank you for, uh, for holding your comments or putting them into the chat so that the NRWA team can sort those through. Um, we're talking about the Quinnipoxit Dam, or some people call it the Oakdale Dam, and the proposed removal project tonight. I've got kind of a lot to cover, but I think we can do it pretty efficiently. I want to start talking about a little bit about dam removal in general. Why are people removing dams? What's it all about? Um, and, you know, why should you care? And then we'll kind of segue into talking more about the Quinnipoxit Dam, the Oakdale Dam. What's it like there? Um, why is this dam different from almost all of the other ones in Massachusetts uh, that we've seen? Um, 
and why is removing it such a great opportunity? We'll, we'll kind of hone in from there, talking about our goals for the project and some of these really interesting site constraints. Every dam is different. Um, as much as we wish uh, to, that we could somewhat streamline the process, dam practitioners recognize that every site is very different and we have to take into account those. So we'll talk about some of those factors tonight and kind of walk through some of the main elements of the design that we've come up with. From there, we'll wrap up with a look ahead into the future and talk really briefly about how you can help support this effort because um, involvement and participation from the general public is always so important for restoration projects of all kinds. You know, as Martha mentioned, this is a team effort. Every project that the Division of Ecological Restoration has worked on has been a team project. This is one of our priority restoration projects where we partner with a landowner and develop a technical team to get projects done. In this case, working with the Mass uh, Water Resources Authority, MWRA and DCR, we've brought in expertise from Mass Wildlife, their, their fisheries folks, as well as from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to add to our technical team so that we can really understand what are our best approaches toward achieving our restoration goals here. Um, and of course, while maintaining the the health and safety of this tremendous water source that we have in the Wachusett Reservoir. So nothing that we do at DER is done alone, so I always want to make sure to acknowledge my team members to start. So let's kick it off just by talking about dam rule. I, I mean, I know I'm talking in one of the hot spots of restoration in Massachusetts, quite frankly. The Nashua River, um, especially with the lead of the town of Pepperell and others, um, is really emerging as one of the hotspots for restoration. So many of you probably have some level of familiarity with the removal of the Millie Turner Dam on the Nisitisset. Um, and if you do, that's great. If you don't, I invite you to learn more about that. As you know, as we, all of us who grew up or live in, in New England recognize that dams uh, are really part of our, our landscape, our cult cultural heritage. And they date back to our colonial times in our pre-industrial history where rivers were dammed and those dams uh, used that water to provide mechanical power for sawmills and for grist mills and those kind of things. And in fact, the earliest laws in Massachusetts required dam owners to open their sluiceways and open their gates to allow fish, especially river herring, to move through. Uh, so those are some of the earliest laws um, regarding river management in, in the Commonwealth. This is sort of the idyllic, you know, New England village that we all know so well. Of course, as we moved into the Industrial Revolution, those dams were replaced or added on to, and instead of moving mechanical gears and things for sawmills and for grist mills, those uh, dams began to be used to divert water for process water for textile mills like the ones you see here. Um, that water, instead of moving mechanical gears, was being used to generate electricity and, and other kinds of hydropower for larger industries. And of course, in this era, uh, the rivers of Massachusetts were really just awash with pollution uh, from our industry, um, from the wide scale development and deforestation going on to harvest wood. Um, you know, we had a, a tremendous impact on our, our rivers and streams. Fast forwarding to the 20th century, those mills in general, many of those mills are gone, but the dams in many cases still remain. And while those initial purposes for those mills have gone, um, some of the upkeep on, 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 on many of our dams in Massachusetts has been left, it, left neglected, I should say. Um, and so these owners are looking at this relict, really important part of our history, important part of our, important part of our cultural fabric, and coming to realize that the changes that we're seeing with climate change and the age of these structures really is making it harder to keep up the maintenance on, on, these, on these dams. So as many of you know, we've got over 3,000 dams in Massachusetts. That's just the ones we know about. Um, it's literally every year we find a couple new ones just through working with satellite imagery or being out in the field. Um, there are dams created for 
um, not just those grist mills like I showed before, but even small farmers' ice ponds and those kind of things fragment our rivers. In general, dams break up the river system and they cause that water to become stagnated. They cause solar heating and um, of course, block up the free movement, not just of water, but of sediment and of nutrients and of the fish and wildlife that we rely on. So the impacts from the dams in Massachusetts, really anywhere you're looking at with the exception of Nantucket, I guess, um, those, those impacts from dams are really widespread. It's important to note that of those 3,000 dams, only less than 10% are used for things like flood control or hydropower or water supply. And, and typically, dams in the configuration like the Oakdale Dam really have no potential to be used for flood control, even though we instinctively think of them holding back water. Um, and while those impoundments may not have their original purpose, they're not running grist mills or um, sawmills and things. Uh, in many cases, those impoundments still provide a lot of recreational benefits. They still provide habitat to fish and wildlife of varying kinds. And so really what we're trying to do at DER is to work with landowners who are facing the burden of maintaining this aging infrastructure in the face of climate change um, and concerned about their the resources that they have to put forward to deal with that operation maintenance, deal with the liability of those structures. And what we want to do, in, because we're using, uh, you know, we're using public funds and public resources, is we want to target the best opportunities for removal. The ones where removing the dam can have a benefit throughout the watershed. You know, we think of these impacts from dams as, well, excuse me, I guess we should say, when we look at the dams around us, there's a, a tendency for us to say, oh, these dams have been here for forever. You know, my great grandfather swam there and all these things. So that's true in our lifetime, but really it's refreshing to think on a larger, more geologic, or even in terms of the fish and wildlife species that have evolved here, the dams are a very short amount of time um, in that history. And what that means is that by and large, by removing those dams, we remove those stressors. And what we've seen at these sites is that those ecological processes rebound very quickly. The whole idea behind dam removal is to remove the barriers, take away the anthropogenic, the human built infrastructure and allow, for, allow the river to repair itself, allow it to, um, to be restored by restoring the processes, the movement of water, the uh, growth of vegetation, the movement and redistribution of sediment. Those are all important things that rivers provide. It's not just a highway of water. So when we remove a dam, what we're really doing is allowing for that kind of channel complexity and that kind of community complexity, whether we're talking about plants or animals, to reestablish. And out of, you know, since 1999, there have been over 60 dams removed in Massachusetts. And at each one of those, a slightly different approach was taken given the site constraints. And it's, it's really impressive to see how fast many of those ecological functions can rebound. Now, removing a dam, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> um, I'm preaching to the choir here, is, is a very helpful thing, uh, a wonderful, great benefit to the environment. But it is an impact. It is an intervention that is a disturbance of something that a system that has been relatively stable, somewhat stable probably for up to 200 years. And so for that reason, it really needs to be thought through and done according to some best practices. In 2007, the state of Massachusetts issued two guidance documents for dam removal proponents to guide and inform how they would move forward with dam removal and how dam removal relates to the wetland regulations that we have here. Today, removing a dam requires multiple permits from the local, the state, and the federal level. And each of those permit processes has their own rules and uh, comment periods and appeal periods, quite frankly, um, so that there's an opportunity to engage with stakeholders um, 
and to, for the proponent, honestly, to demonstrate that their project is being done thoughtfully and being done in a way that maximizes those benefits um, from the project. As I said, there's been over 60 dam removals done in Massachusetts. Every year, the nonprofit group American Rivers publishes a list of all the dam removals reported to it in the United States. Um, last year, across America, there were 69 dam removals, and six of them were in Massachusetts, which I think is pretty great. Um, and you can see we've done projects from Clarksburg all the way out to Cape Cod, and we've got a number of dam removals in planning. Um, again, from the Berkshires to the Northeast um, and to the Southeast. Um, each one of these is, is a, a quite a different site and has uh, different constraints and, and restoration opportunities associated with it. From the dam owner's perspective, I think in general, what we see is that the dam owners are concerned about their liability. They're concerned about the costs of maintenance. Um, and thankfully, there are state, federal, and NGO entities that are really interested in supporting those landowners to do a dam removal, do restoration projects, because they have so many benefits, both not just to our ecology, but to our public safety and what some people call our community resiliency, the resiliency of our communities to the effects of climate change. All right, so that's all well and good. Why are we? Why are we here at the Quinnipoxa Dam, at the Oakdale Dam? Well, we have some really unique ecological benefits um, at play here from thinking about removing this dam. Um, the main one is connectivity of habitat, the connection of habitat. The Oakdale Dam is in pretty decent, is in decent shape, but it still stands as a complete barrier to fish and wildlife moving upstream. In this case, well, what we're most excited about is landlocked salmon, like you see from the, uh, the picture on the left from On the Water magazine, and wild uh, brook trout that use both the river and the trout that move um, that are in the Wachusett Reservoir. So as you may know, the landlocked salmon in the Wachusett um, typically move into the rivers for spawning. At this time, they can't get up into the Quinnipoxit because of the dam. So virtually all of the spawning that happens for landlocked salmon happens in the Stillwater River, which isn't too far away. But in addition to providing connectivity for brook trout, if we could get those Atlantic, excuse me, those landlocked salmon up into the beautiful uh, habitat of the Quinnipoxit River to spawn, that would be a tremendous benefit to those fish um, moving into the future. I'm going to share some of these, some other images like this as we go along, but here's a satellite image of the dam site. You can see it on the left, Quinnipoxit River is flowing left to right into the Wachusett. And one of the benefits of any dam removal, but certainly here at the Quinnipoxit, is addressing risk. We know the science is very clear that what we're seeing from climate change are more frequent, larger storm events, rain events. Um, those are stressing our aging infrastructure. On the other side of the coin, we're seeing longer periods of drought. We're seeing uh, higher average air temperatures, but longer periods of drought in the summertime, which means that those negative impacts that dams have on our rivers and on the wildlife is even more exacerbated because of that. So by removing a dam like the, like the Oakdale Dam, it's an opportunity to address potential risk of any kind of failure or issues there, both in terms of the excellent water quality in the Wachusett Reservoir, but also in terms of these ecological processes that are under threat from climate change. And that is a perfect segue and, um, and very closely related, of course, to climate change resiliency. We tend to think of this both in terms of ecological resiliency, that's how our, our natural systems will um, be resistant to or adapt to uh, these climate change effects, and also community resiliency in terms of our human uses and built infrastructure. So we know that precipitation is changing. We know that air temperatures are rising. Um, in 2016, Governor Baker uh, issued an executive order, Executive Order 569, I believe it is, um, directing state agencies to develop an integrated approach to handling climate change. And MWRA, DCR, Department of Fish and Game, you know, are all part of that. 
And so um, I think we all take it very seriously, our responsibility to be prepared for the changes that are coming and the changes that we're seeing right now. So removing barriers in rivers like the Oakdale Dam is a perfect opportunity to kind of be honest with the, you know, the, the community and say, look, there's a lot of resources that go into maintaining and operating a dam in good condition and keeping it safe. Perhaps we should think more about how those costs and those burdens um, impact, you know, uh, impact climate change resiliency. So let's get into some talk about the Oakdale Dam because this, honestly, um, I've been working on dam rules since 2007 and I have not seen a site like this. And I wanna share a little bit about why this site is so cool in addition to these benefits um, that I just talked about. So the Quinnipoxit River is a, a natural river. It's a beautiful river. <laughs> um, and when the Wachusett Reservoir was being built, folks were very concerned about the movement of sediment and turbidity down that river into the Wachusett. So here's a great photo from 1905. Um, you're looking downstream, you can see the rail line over on the right. I'm not sure if y'all can see my cursor, I hope you can. Um, that's where the rail trail is nowadays that I'm sure many folks um, you know, in the area walk and, and travel on. Um, and what you can see here is, is a pretty nice natural river. It's, it's fairly over widened, it looks kind of kind of shallow to me, but it's really interesting to see that with all this lush vegetation. Um, you see a lot of rock and cobble here. Um, the cool thing, uh, John Gregoire from MWRA pointed this out to me, is, is you can read the inscription at the bottom of this postcard and it says, Wachusett Reservoir, whoops, it says Wachusett Reservoir, Quinnipoxit River Channel before improvement. And I think that's cool because that really gives you a window into the, the minds of of engineers back in those days and saying, this is this river needed work, it needed improvement. And now here we are maybe somewhat trying to undo that improvement, if you will. Here's a view from the other way. You can still see the rail line in the distance up on the bluff, but here we have, we have horse carts and mule carts and, and workers using shovels to move sediment and move material. And what they're doing is widening that channel as you probably know from playing around in, in rain puddles or, or streams in your backyard, the wider the channel is, the slower the water moves and the less erosive force it has. So that was one of the goals here, was to make a nice wide channel leading down into the Wachusett Reservoir so that the sediment and sands moving down could be captured, would fall out as the water slowed. And here you can see that in 1905, they're, they're just getting after it with shovels, and picks and, and, and mule, mule and horse carts. Here's another view building the actual dam. What you see here is workers are using this, uh, setting up the wooden forms to pour the concrete. This is, this is partly a masonry dam. There's a lot of uh, granite block involved, but it does have um, a concrete cap and a concrete spillway. So you can see that happening there, pretty cool. Here's what it looked like. So let's see, that was September 2nd, 1905. You can see that at the bottom. And then by the end of September, they had all the pour done. All the pours were done and you can see the, the smooth concrete surface. So this is really exceptional. One of the coolest things about working on dam removal projects and, and many kinds of, of restoration projects is getting to learn the history. And I'll talk a little bit later about how really all dam removal projects, but how specifically at the Oakdale Dam, we'll probably be, we'll be working to honor that history. These are cool. This is um, directly from the drawings, the, the engineered plans for the dam. And you can see the, the very distinctive horseshoe shape. You see no fish ladder yet. That's kind of interesting. But the number one thing I want to draw your attention to at the bottom here is, is one of the number one things that makes this dam unique. Specifically, what you see here is that the crest of, of the dam was built into the slope of the river. So instead of building a wall in the river behind which sediment you know, travels down and falls out behind the dam as the water goes over generations after generation, that channel widening, as I'll show you in these next pictures, was happening downstream of the dam. The dam is actually sort of holding back the river bed upstream of that widened area. 
very unique um, uh, in, in, in the dams that I've seen in New England and very beneficial to us in many ways. Because what that means is, unlike many of the dams that you see in your town, um, we don't have a large impoundment. We don't have this big pond behind there where river water's moving in, carrying sediment, potentially carrying contamination from decades and generations ago, industrial activities that can build up behind the dams. In this case, we have a, a protected watershed. The water is moving down, it moves over the dam, and then it hits that larger basin, that widened area where the sediment falls out before entering the Wachusett Reservoir. A really interesting approach to that problem. And I guess you could say it's been working pretty well. It's been keeping the Wachusett clean in this end of it. Here's a great photo. I don't know if this was taken by a plane or what. This is, um, you can see that widening going on. And you remember the, the, the horse carts, the, the mule carts moving sediment out. This is looking downstream toward the, what would, is now the Wachusett Reservoir and the Quinnipoxit Basin. And you can see the, the stabilized banks, the rock placed, and this really over widened section to allow sediment to fall out. Really just an amazing picture. Um, with the train kind of crossing, uh, crossing the view at the bottom. And here's what that channel looks like now. You can see that kind of sinuous widened channel. Here things have grown in quite a bit, but you can still see that. This is right directly, this is from a drone shot taken directly right over the dam, if you will, looking downstream. And you can see that we've got these islands of sediment, these rocks, boulders, these cobbles that have fallen out of the of the river water before entering the Wachusett Reservoir. So that's a lot about this site. Where the heck are we? I mean, you know, I kind of take it for granted that you all <laughs> are familiar with this site, but um, this is a, a very simple map I made today showing the Nashua watershed, these other large watersheds of Massachusetts. Um, and our this, this yellow, orangish star is the location of the Quinnipoxit Dam. The, uh, the Quinnipoxit runs roughly west to east into the Wachusett. Um, but it's not the only water source, of course, as you probably know, and, and some of you know better than I do. The Wachusett Reservoir is receiving water from the aqueduct that uh, originates at the Quabbin Reservoir. So all of our friends in the greater Boston area receiving their drinking water from the MWRA. We are working on this dam directly adjacent to the flow path for that water, which is a really exceptionally cool um, perspective to have on, on the importance of this project um, as it relates to our most critical human infrastructure. So here we are, you know, as, as Martha well pointed out, we're in the, the southern section, the, the upper, upper reaches of the Nashua River watershed. And here's that uh, satellite view again. Again, the Quinnipoxit River is coming in from left to right here. You can see the dam location. And you can see these large, the over widened section that I talked about that we saw in that, that very cool picture from 1904, 1905. And the large basin carved out to be a receptacle, to be a um, forebay, if you will for those sediments um, to protect the quality of water in the Wachusett. We're at the far western edge of the Wachusett Reservoir, and I didn't know this, maybe you, um, you don't know it either, but the actual, uh, the, where the water goes out of the Wachusett is on the far eastern side. So it's really interesting to, to see all this and understand how important it is to ensure that water quality before the miles of travel that it, that water has for heading into the pipes to head toward greater Boston. So really kind of a cool perspective here. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see some of the really important factors. Obviously the Quinnipoxit River, again, not much of an impoundment. You can see these large boulders popping up. It's fairly shallow in through here. This beautiful arch dam, these retaining walls. And here is the aqueduct outlet. You know, here we have water um, coming down. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's almost 200 feet, maybe it's 150 feet or so. And, and the power of that water is being harnessed to create hydroelectric energy here at the, at the Oakdale Power Station. So a really unique situation here where we have this natural river 
um, subject to the, the ups and downs of, of precipitation and summer temperatures and, and, and flows right next to this very important, this critical underground aqueduct being outlet here, bringing water from the Quabbin into the Wachusett Reservoir. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's a cool shot um, looking across. You can see how smooth the dam faces. You can see a lot of bedrock. That's very common. You know, often dams were built on bedrock ledges or small falls to kind of take up and, and make use of um, hydro, you know, hydrostatic pressure. Um, in this case, as I said, the, the bed of the river is right upstream, excuse me, at the very crest of that dam. No real impoundment. I mentioned a fish ladder. This is, if you're looking downstream, this would be on river left. Um, if you're looking upstream, it's on your right. Uh, granite block and concrete fish ladder. Unfortunately, as, as kind of cool and interesting as this is, our friends at Mass Wildlife tell us that this is not a very effective means for, for moving the, the fish up and allowing those fish to move up into the Quinnipoxit River. But an important component of the site and obviously part of its historical value. There's that impoundment, as I showed before, again, very shallow, really not much of an impoundment. They basically cut off the, the, the bed of the river in a way um, and put the dam in there to make about a, I don't know, I think that's about an eight to 10 foot step there, total height. So this is a cool site. How, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do here? As with any project, it really starts with our goals. Number one goal for MWRA is maintaining excellent water quality in the Wachusett Reservoir. That goes without saying. And that's really why MWRA, like, like pretty much every dam owner uh, for a dam removal project, the, the owner is really in the driver's seat. Um, our agency and others support the landowner in doing that work. Well, in this case with MWRA um, in the driver's seat, water quality and having strict measures to prevent turbidity as part of doing this project are of top concern. As I said before though, we're all, we're all spending this time and, and, and energy to look at this because we wanna reconnect the Quinnipoxit River and the Wachusett Reservoir. For those landlocked salmon, the trout, any, and other species too. You know, wild brook trout streams, what Mass Wildlife calls certif um, Certified cold water fisheries, cold water fishery resources, I mean, are, are fairly rare and declining resource with climate change and with urbanization in Massachusetts. So when there's an opportunity like this to address improvements for those species that rely on cold, clean water um, while addressing community resiliency, we really wanna do what we can to pull together a team to make this project happen. Finally, you know, that Quabbin Aqueduct is critical, obviously, for the water supply for Greater Boston and, and so many communities, but also for the function of the Oakdale Power Station. So when we're going to get in there and we're going to do this one-time intervention, we don't want to set up something that we have to come back and maintain and monkey with and, you know, always be, uh, be working on. We want to do a one-time intervention that meets our goals, but also make sure that we establish and continue the function of the aqueduct and the power station. Now I showed you some of those, those satellite and, and the drone photos. This is what it looks like in our engineer's drawing. So in this case, the Quinnipoxit River, we'll start at the top here. Quinnipoxit River is moving from left to right. You can see the arch of the dam very clearly here. And you can see the aqueduct outlet. This is the power station here. And so what happens is the Quinnipoxit River fluctuates. The, the amount of water coming down depends on, on uh, precipitation, um, you know, how much water is evaporating within the watershed, et cetera. And meanwhile, right next to that beautiful river is this aqueduct, which is delivering very clean and very cold water um, throughout most of the year um, as part of the drinking water system. Looking uh, at the cross section, you can see very, very little um, accumulated sediment behind the dam, just a couple feet worth 
and again, this is all very coarse material. We don't have a lot of sand and silt because the watershed is protected. We don't have a lot of the impacts that are so common in our watersheds um, that add a lot of small and soft sediment to, to our rivers. And then downstream, where it was designed and, and widened out, as we showed you, to collect the sediment, what you see nowadays is you see a lot of boulders and a lot of cobbles that have accumulated in that area. That's what it was supposed to do. And so these are our constraints. This is, this is kind of the system that we're working with. As I mentioned before, we have this clean cold water coming out of the aqueduct at the power station. And if you go today, um, you, uh, you can kind of walk down this path here uh, from parking over on the, on the road there. And you'll see the landlocked salmon lined up and really attracted to the flow from that aqueduct. Take a look, I mean, just from this drone picture, you can see there's not much water coming over the Oakdale Dam on this particular day. Um, but you can be sure that clean, cold water is coming through the aqueduct and that's very attractive to those, to those fish. So working with our fish biologist friends, on one side of the table, on the other side, obviously the MWRA folks and, and, and trying to and maintain uh, fidelity to their mission to bring clean water to Boston and all MWRA subscribers. I want to just walk through the main elements of our design. Now our design isn't complete. We're at about 50 or 60 percent complete and this is a good stage to start to vet some of these ideas and get public input and we'll be taking these um, plans into regulatory permitting to get regulatory input. But here are the main elements. So I, you know, as you saw in those pictures, we've got an eight to 10 foot dam. We've got to make up those, that grade difference somehow. And the way that we're going to do that, we're proposing to use these riffles. And I'll show you what these riffle structures look like. But they're basically like that bubbly kind of um, uh, turbulent water that you see along any natural river um, where it goes from a little bit higher to a little bit lower. In between those, we want to provide pools. We want to make sure that we're designing this so that the water is going to continue to scour out a little bit deeper sections. And that's important because fish, like you and me, get tired. You know, you can only sprint so far before you need a rest. And that's the same with fish. So we've worked with um, fisheries biologists to understand how to space the riffles and to provide pools for resting in between. I'll show you what some of that looks like from some other sites. But as I said before, these fish are naturally attracted to the clean, cold water that comes out of the aqueduct. To deal with that, we're proposing to use regrading and moving, repositioning some of the existing cobbles and boulders to create a couple areas where the bed rises up, not a berm where the water flows through, but slightly shallower areas so that fish are less attracted and less able to move into this channel toward the aqueduct. We want them to be up here into the, in the quinopoxic. They want to become imprinted and, and realize that they can move into this river. So we're going to do that at two places. And we're going to also provide a little bit of an escape route so that we're repositioning the cobbles and boulders to create this barrier between the quinopoxic, whoops, sorry about that, between the quinopoxic and the, the aqueduct. But any fish that do get into this area, we want to provide them a way to get back out. So that is part of it. I apologize. Design plans never translate well to PowerPoint. Um, they're even worse if we were projecting it. If we were in a big hall somewhere and I was projecting this, it, it'd look even worse than this. So I hope you can kind of get the general idea of our approach here. I want to show you what these riffles look like. Here's a riffle structure that we built as part of a dam removal in Andover. And this is on the Shawsheen River. You can see just from this vantage point how the water surface on the upstream side of Stephen Street here looks a bit higher than down here to the right. And each, all of these boulders are placed and strategically aligned and sized so that they provide a stable gradient for the, that is also passable, excuse me, that the hydraulics are such that the fish can pass through. In this case with the, with the uh, with the Shawshin, um, we were interested in, of course, passing trout, but also river herring, um, because this is a, such an important diadromous fish run. 
Um, so there's a great example of what a riffle looks like once it's built. This is from a, a, a different site. This is summertime, low water on the Setucket River in West Bridgewater. But I wanted to show you this because in this vision here, in this, this is the former dam was right about where these words are. And what we did here was we created a similar kind of riffle pool sequence. So the fish moving upstream, um, you know, shoot through the riffle and they have time to rest in the pool and not just rest, but have some cover. We want them to, that, those pools to be relatively deep so that they're safer from predators. And that gives them time to recharge and shoot the next riffle up into the river system. So I just wanted to share those because these, these are fairly common treatments that we do, um, but they require a good amount of understanding of the river hydraulics and the flows so that we can size the boulders appropriately and also create these in ways, as I said, we don't, nobody wants to be going back out to maintain these structures. We wanna build them so that they're self-sustaining based on the flows of the river um, that they'll endure without human maintenance. So here's that plan view again. Um, these plans are gonna be made available as part of our MEPA filing coming up the Mass Environmental Policy Act filing that we'll be doing later this summer. Um, and that'll be another chance to see these, maybe in a little better detail, but you can see again, the main goal being to separate the quinopoxit from the aqueduct and then make sure we're providing sustainable, durable passage for the fish um, on that side. So we continue to have the excellent function of the, the Oakdale power station, unimpeded water flow and for the aqueduct, for the drinking water, and then um, renaturalized access for the fish in the quinopoxit. So that's all well and good, but obviously this is a very cool and, and like so like most dams in Massachusetts, a very historically important site. All dam removal projects uh, have to consider both historical and archaeological resources. So I wanted to mention that we're doing that as part of our investigations, as part of our work in this. Um, we have hired trained um, industrial historians and archeologists to do the research, to do the investigations that are necessary so that we can coordinate both on the local level, um, but also with state and tribal entities, because that's all wrapped up in our permitting um, for this work. Now, we, as I said, there've been over 60 dams removed in Massachusetts and virtually each one has incorporated some level of mitigation because you know, these are important, these structures are important to the landscape and historical fabric of our communities. So some of the mitigation options that are pretty typical are having the work, the construction, the actual dam removal work overseen by industrial historians and by archaeologists to document the work and document the findings. What's cool about that is then we have archival reports and photos that can be kept with the local or state archives. Um, that, it, you know, that really kind of describe the history and this major event for, for the site. Very often there's opportunities to pres preserve some of the masonry, like some of the wing walls or maybe even the fish ladder. Some of those elements can be preserved outside of the flow of the restored river that still stand, will stand as monuments to what was there previously. And of course, interpretive signage, archival photos, those kind of things really, um, you know, are, are much long, are very long lasting and are set up to really tell the story, not just of the restoration project of all the, the wonderful, you know, uh, environmental benefits, but also to honor the history of the state. So those are some of the mitigation options that we'll be considering as we continue um, to coordinate with the local state and tribal entities on this. All right, so I'm sure a bunch of you have been wondering how much is this thing gonna cost? Well, right now our engineers have given us an estimate of about 1.3 million for implementation. Um, and what's exciting, what's good about that, and that, that's a big number to anybody um, that I know of, but on the other side, there's so many state, federal and NGO entities that are really poised to assist and have been providing reliable funding and support for projects like this. So. I, you know, as with just about every other dam removal that has taken place in New England and Massachusetts, the funding for this project will most likely come from a variety of sources. That's just 
inevitable. No one entity ever has enough resources to make a project happen on their own. Just like with the technical development of a project, the funding is almost always a team effort. Now, dam removal projects don't happen overnight. This one certainly won't either. Um, it's, that's partly because working through the design permitting and outreach process, it's sort of an iterative development. As I said before, the plans that we have now are about 60% complete. We're gonna be honing and refining those, adding additional details as we move through the regulatory process and as we get input from stakeholders through those processes. So we've been thinking about this and working on this for quite a while. I've been really excited. I've been involved from day one and we've had some great and, and, and thoughtful um, <laughs> conversations and, and a lot of, you know, a lot of very careful examinations of, of data, collecting data and engineering analysis. In 2021, we're really kicking off our outreach to the community. This is part of that. And as I said, we'll be going to review under the MEPA, uh, the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. If you're not familiar with MEPA, I sometimes describe it as sort of the coming out party for the project. You've put in enough thought that you really have an idea of what you want to do to attain your goals. And now through the MEPA process is a place to get um, your first opportunity to get written comments and input from the regulatory community and the public. With those comments, we'll continue to refine the design and then get into the actual permitting process. You remember the slide I showed before, uh, this project is probably gonna need about five different permits, state, federal, and local. Um, best case scenario, if all funding can be sourced, implementation may be in late 2023, 2024 is also probably likely. And from there, we wanna continue to monitor for a few years and make sure everything is, establishing and getting set up the way that we planned and engineered it to. Last but not least, I hope that your interest in joining this conversation tonight and the information I've provided has made you want to get involved. And so I'm here to ask that if you support restoring, you know, restoring habitat, restoring ecological functions, please make your voice heard. There are a number of ways to do that through the MEPA process, through the permitting process, um, there's not, um, there can never be enough uh, support voiced for this work um, and to strengthen the, really the, sh the community that we've developed in Massachusetts of outdoorsmen, of, of, um, of fishers and, and recreationalists and people who just want a healthy environment to speak up and say, yes, we want these kinds of projects to, help, to happen, excuse me. Finally, there may be opportunities for post-removal monitoring or other ways to get groups involved in being part of collecting data to demonstrate the effectiveness of the project. So that's, that's a little ways off, of course, but we hope that by having this outreach with people, we'll start to plant the seeds for that kind of involvement. So I've covered a lot. Um, I don't know how long it's been. <laughs> um, um, hopefully I didn't go too fast for you. If we can't answer your question tonight, I'm putting my email up there. Please feel free to email me. If I can't answer it, I'd be happy to forward your question on to MWRA or DCR folks. Um, if it's something that's just out of my wheelhouse to answer, I'd be happy to, to expand that conversation. Um, thank you for bearing with me through this presentation. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing uh, folks' questions and comments. Thank you, Nick. That was great. <laughs> um, and we we have a, so it's seven fifty four. So we have six minutes. We can go over. We don't have to stop right at eight if we haven't answered all the questions. We can do that if you're you know available. But I'll start right at the top with the first question from um, Evan Eckhorn. Um, it, or comment. Great pictures. What a treat. I think you put that up after the historical pictures were shown. Um, were there any more reasons or notes the original engineers gave for building the dam? Was it to slow the water entering the reservoir for some reason? Yes, it was meant to slow the, res the water entering the reservoir and provide that larger area for the sediment to fall out before entering the, the reservoir. Okay, and the next question from Nancy Kratzis. Um, 
Why was the fish ladder not effective and are they ever effective? <laughs> what I like to say, and I'm not a fisheries biologist, so um, bear with me, but I've worked with enough to know and I've worked at enough sites to say that even the best fish ladder, the best designed fish ladder only works for certain species a certain amount of the time. It's really dependent on careful engineering of the hydraulics within that structure, right? And so too much water, too little water, um, really can affect whether the fish will use it enough. In addition, the location of a fish ladder matters incredibly. I talked about how the water coming out of the Quabbin aqueduct has a very strong attraction to the salmon, right? That fisheries biologists call that attractant flow. If you've got a ladder that's this big on the side of a dam that's this big, there's not enough attractant flow sometimes for the fish to see that and get in there. Similarly, because you have to build such a long slope for a lot of fish ladders, the entrance to the fish ladder is fairly somewhat far downstream from where the actual dam is. So if a fish doesn't catch that signal to go into the ladder entrance, they'll swim right past it and just kind of be stuck upstream at the dam. And that's the case at the quinopoxit uh, ladder. It's off to the side. It's not nearly getting enough or the right kind of attractant flow to attract enough fish in there reliably. Hey, Martha, sorry, was... can I add to that, if you don't mind? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, that fish ladder was added in the, the 1930s. We've got some drawings showing that. And soon after that was added, the Quabbin Aqueduct came online around 1940, 41. And then the, you know, the fish were just not going to that ladder and it fell into disrepair. And then just really, it may have worked initially for the first year or two, but after the aqueduct came online, it was you know, a foregone conclusion that it was just never gonna work anymore. And then just fell into disrepair. Maybe Jamie Carr has a little more to, to add on that. No, that sounds like a good summary, John. It just, you know, right from the start, it was kind of an unfortunate, you know, Putting in a fish ladder after the fact is never ideal anyway, but in that circumstance, it didn't seem to work out in terms of passing fish pretty much right from the start. And that was quite a number of years ago. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Daniel Welsh, who um, is a Fitchburg State University fisheries biologist. And he asks, what are the riffles made from? Is it natural stone or some kind of more human created material like concrete? No, it's always natural stone. And what's it's an interesting challenge because natural river stones, as, as anyone has ever seen, are tend to be very rounded. They've been tumbled around and, and, and moved by the water. Um, however, it's really tough to build something out of marbles, for example, something really round. So they need to be does they need to be selected um, and specified through an engineering process to make sure they're going to be stable. They're going to be stable against the flows, the predicted shear stresses of the water that flows through. And are, these aren't just kind of dumped rocks, they're actually built in layers. And what you see at the top, that, that kind of nice riffle, even in this, this silly photo of me here, you can see this kind of riffle behind me. If you look closer, you can see the larger boulders. Those are, are set very carefully and purposefully to provide anchoring and support to the smaller boulders and cobbles around it. These are dynamic structures. You know, it's not like a weir. You could build a weir out of gigantic boulders and, and make a step. But if you did that, if you build a step like that and there's some deformity or some change, that can really become a fish passage barrier in itself. The advantage of a riffle is basically what you're doing is you're burying that step within a matrix of boulders and cobbles the river can move some of that smaller stuff, but the anchoring, the larger uh, material stays. And so it becomes a, a very dynamic structure, but it's also sustainable, just like riffles are that are naturally created. Sorry, I muted myself. My cat's trying to get in through a door. <laughs> um, next uh, question or statement is from Evan Eckhorn. Um, I have paddled the Quinn quite a few times before. Would there be any consideration for paddling past the riffles? Obviously, you cannot go past the dam now and shouldn't paddle in the reservoir. 
Yeah, under certain flows, they will certainly be passable. That's definitely true. Is it allowed? I don't know what's allowed. Do you see our people who want to comment on? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can say right? just generally at this stage in the design process, at the 60% design, we don't have all the access points and limit of public access figured out yet. Um, as you know, from paddling the river, you know, the dam is there. So right now you can't wade or boat past that location where the existing dam is. So it's likely that we'll have a, you know, kind of a, a demarcation of where you can wade and boat to, you know, that may be similar to where the dam location is now. It might be a little bit upstream, it might be a little bit downstream, but we don't, you know, we're still, we have that handicapped access um, for, sh for shore angling now, and we have shore angling shore angling below um, the dam area. So, you know, we'll, we'll work to make sure that there is good public access, um, but you know, those exact lines are still to be figured out. Yeah, can I add to that, Jamie? Also uh, with the, uh, you know, the co-op and transfer going on, there are times that we could be transferring up to 300 million gallons a day. And it's quite a, quite a turbulent uh, a force entering the river right there. I'm sure some of the paddlers um, that are on can handle a class four uh, with no problem, but there may be others who can't, and it could be kind of an unsafe environment at the tail race where it comes into the into the river. Okay, thanks. Um, from Conrad, I am a whitewater paddler and intimately familiar with the mighty Quinn. Uh, the river above the dam is not entirely natural. There are a couple of vertical drops apparently due to man-made structures, one at Route 190 and another at the Old Mill Dam site a couple of miles upstream where the old sluiceway is uh, there and could possibly be converted to a fish ladder. Have the fish flow folks investigated these existing upstream uh, obstructions? I guess the short answer is no. I mean, we know that those are there and we've made sure that there's nothing going on there that would affect the hydraulics or the hydrology at the Oakdale Dam. Um, but no, at this time, there's no plans to, to do anything other than what we've kind of described here tonight. Maybe after the dam comes out, they can start looking farther upstream. Yeah, it'd be really fun to do that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which happens a lot, I guess. I mean, you have some- That's right, projects that's right. <laughs> where you move up. Um, another question, how will the landlocked salmon be reintroduced to the river? Will they naturally move in or will they need assistance? Um, I'm pretty sure they will They will naturally move. The, I, you know, they're already trying to move into that area, especially at spawning times. Um, a large portion take advantage of the Stillwater River, of course. Um, but no, to, to my knowledge, there's no plan to trap them or truck them or do anything like that. Okay, we have one comment that says, great info, thanks from Martha Moore. Um, from Henry uh, Diallo. Um, so the removal of the dam shouldn't have any effect on water le levels or depth upstream on the river? That's right. And that's the, that's the purpose of those riffles is to maintain that elevation. So we're going to basically take what's a, a drop and just kind of ease that out. And so the water elevations should stay the same. Okay. Uh, from Peter Sterndale, the Central Massachusetts um, chapter of Trout Unlimited. Is there a list of all organizations that are supporting this effort? Are there meetings slash newsletters to support? Not just yet, no. Um, we haven't really started a larger outreach campaign to, um, to kind of draw people in and keep people informed, but um, that's definitely a great suggestion and, and one we can talk over. Imagine any help from the Trout Unlimited folks is, would be very welcome. <laughs> I didn't know from that. anybody, certainly. From anybody, right. And we can help you. Um, from Martha Moore, is the state law that says the owner of the property is the owner of the dam, um, does that complicate your initiatives? Um, given the, that most of the dams in Massachusetts are very old, it's not uncommon that uh, dam ownership is contested or uncertain um, on some degree. In this case, we don't have that, thankfully, but um, just as a related anecdote, we uh, one of the dams that we worked with the town of Andover to remove from the Shawsheen River, um, we had the town of Andover owned one side of the river, um, a private landowner, an apartment complex owned the other side. The property line was right in the middle, 
but the dam, the dam structure itself had somehow through all the multiple changes of ownership over the generations was actually owned by a textile company in South Carolina. And so we had to get some, we had, speaking of our team effort on things, we had to include some lawyers on our team to track that, to do the deed research, track those folks down, alert them that they actually owned a huge chunk of concrete in the middle of a river in Massachusetts and ask them if they would release their rights to it. So um, hopefully that answers the question. It is, it is never, it is not always very clear cut. Okay, thanks. So we have a few more questions. It's already five past eight, but oh, if you want to keep going or- Sure, we can do a few more, sure. Okay. Uh, where is this project on the priority list of the 3000 dams in Mass or New England? Yeah. Um, so our division uh, operates what we call the priority projects program where we usually every other year or so um, put out a, an RFR and solicit applications um, for landowners and other folks uh, who have the cooperation of landowners to pitch us projects to um, for our assistance, both financial and technical assistance. And that's a competitive process where we compare the relative potential benefits and the relative feasibility of those projects. So, so how many priority projects do you have right now? Uh, uh, priority, yeah, we have um, approximately 20 dam removal projects. Um, so I'm from Pat Rice. Um, are the fish landlocked in the Wachusett and you're trying to get them to go up the Quinnipoxit? I was confused by the description. It would be awfully nice to get them back into the Nashua. Interesting. Yeah, in this case, we're talking about landlocked salmon that live in the Wachusett and are trying to get up into the Quinnipoxit to spawn. Did, did they used to be in the Nashua before the, the Wachusett Dam was built? I would imagine they, those fish were, after. Sorry. yeah, my guess is that those would be Atlantic salmon if they were down that far, I don't know if. Okay. Um, would there be, this is from um, Peter Stan, Sterndale from Central Mass TU, would there be an opportunity to designate a section of the river as fly fishing only, um, kid brook, trout only, et cetera? That's a really interesting idea and definitely one that we should talk with Mass Wildlife about. They're the ones who, regulate that. Okay, and where do the river stones come from? Uh, they would typically be sourced on site. I mean, this is a really great opportunity. Um, just when you go out there, you can see the, the variety of boulders and cobbles, um, you know, that are right there to work with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the dam site is the current takeout for whitewater paddlers. Is there any other further accommodations for this use? Yeah, I think Jamie Plans. and John talked about that, you know, it's still kind of definitely going to have to be be worked out and, and have appropriate direction for those folks. So that's where some of those folks might be able to, to get involved in some of the design, you know, steps. Yeah, absolutely. We want to, we want to make sure we're thinking about all the users of the site, not just anglers. Okay. Uh, from Teague Schultz, uh, uh, Schultz, a uh, comment. Great presentation and very informative. And then let's see, um, Susan Moore says, I love your enthusiasm and enthusiasm enthusiasm in presenting this. You'll be great at MEPA presentations. Our <laughs> Tahanto and Virothon team studied the Wachusett Reservoir history and visited the Boston archives, which would be of interest to the public. I've put some of these pictures on our Tahanto nature trail. I guess. Nice. Like, Excellent. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation and um, they also, uh, the Envirothon team also composed a song for the reservoir for its 100th anniversary, which we created with the events all around the reservoir. Cool. But those are, those are some events, good, uh, fun events during the, the 100th um, um, anniversary of the reservoir. I remember that happening. So I think that's it. I think we've had all the questions and comments. Um, oh, we have one more. Where can we hear the song? Somebody said we could. <laughs> That's right. Next time I should do this with that as a background. That's right, we're gonna, right. We're going to figure that out. Maybe at the celebration when it finally comes out. So Yeah, exactly. So Perfect. Perfect. Um, any other comments from um, John or Jamie or any um, wanna, anything else to add? Thank you so much, everyone. Nick, it was a great presentation. And um, 
feel free to, to email Nick and email um, us and look for our pre other presentations coming up in in um, the end of March about river herring and then you know in in April and May. So thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us, Martha. Okay. We'll say good night. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good job, Nick. Yeah, good job. Thank you. Yeah, nice job, Nick. <laughs>